Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us for our virtual town hall event today. Kids and COVID-19 moving past the myths and on to herd immunity. Our main speaker today will be Dr. Joe Santangelo, Chief Quality and Safety Officer for Munson Healthcare. Uh, but before we get started, I wanna introduce myself. I'm Diane Mihalik, I'm the Chief Marketing and Communications Officer with Munson Healthcare, and just really excited to have you join us as we share um, some new information and talk about myths and facts related to COVID-19. But before we uh, inter, uh, move on to Dr. Sangelo, Dr. Santangelo's comments, um, I'd like to uh, thank and recognize uh, one of our community partners who's helped make this event possible. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ryan Jarvey, who's the Director of Communications for Northwest Michigan Education Services. And that is the new name of the uh, formerly named uh, Traverse Bay Area Intermediate School District. So Ryan, I'd like to just pass it over to you uh, for some opening remarks. Yeah, thanks, Diane. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ryan Jarvey, the Director communications here at Northwest Education Services. Um, just want to you know, welcome everybody here today. Thank you for taking the time. Um, you know, we want to learn a little bit more about COVID-19 vaccines and kind of clear up any misinformation you may have heard circulating in your communities or, or on social media. Um, it's, it's no secret that this pandemic has created a number of challenges for our schools. And as some of you student parents know well some of these challenges have carried over into the home life and you know with school closures and at home learning and it's been a uh, been a burden that's been placed on families through some of these situations and i think we've tried to keep that in mind when you know faced with these difficult situations um ultimately it just comes down to protecting the health of our students in school communities um, it's been shown that vaccines not only lower the risk of contracting the virus and protect people from those negative health effects, but it really reduces the need to quarantine in close contact situations. So all of that can really play a part in keeping classrooms open for in-person learning or, or other extracurricular activities available to students. Um, so through vaccination, you know, we're, we're on a path toward business as usual for schools. Um, it's our hope that as the number of vaccinated people increases, uh, we'll return back to school in the fall uh, to a more normal type of academic year. Um, and, and part of that really revolves around providing people with accurate information about vaccines. And so that's really what brings us here today. Um, Munson Healthcare has been a great community partner throughout this pandemic and in many ways. And we're, we're pleased, sorry about my light, automatically switching off there. Um, but we're pleased to have pediatrician Dr. Santangelo here to uh, really lend his expertise and perspective on this whole situation. So um, just again, thank you for taking the time and I'll turn it back over to the experts. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate those opening remarks and appreciate your uh, partnership as we've been partnering with many of the, the school systems uh, across Northern Michigan. And, you know, we're all here today because um, we all want to move past this pandemic and get back to a normal way of life. And, you know, as the vaccine has been, become, uh, or the COVID-19 vaccine has become more widely available throughout Northern Michigan, we recognize that for some of you, this means hope and excitement. And for others, it has caused quite a deal, uh, a great deal of concern. Uh, so today we're going to uh, uh, spend some time talking specifically about children and COVID-19, vaccines, uh, myths and facts, and how to keep children who can't yet be vaccinated as safe as possible. Uh, we hope to arm you with some information and help ease your concerns, as well as address your specific questions. Uh, if you do have a, a question uh, for Dr. Santangelo, or for me, or for Ryan, as uh, uh, we move through this presentation. Uh, the Q&A feature is enabled, so uh, submit your questions through the Q&A feature. Um, if you are watching us live on Facebook, you can also submit your question on Facebook and those questions will get to us and we'll, we'll get to as many as we possibly can today because again, this session is for you and to answer your questions. Uh, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce Dr. Joe Santangelo, Chief Quality and Safety Officer for Munson Healthcare. And uh, just note that Dr. Santangelo is also a P 
pediatrician. Uh, it has a lot of experience uh, in this area and working with children. Uh, so we're just thrilled and excited uh, that you could join us today, Dr. Santangelo, and I'll kick it off. I'll, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Diane, and thanks to everyone who's watching today. And uh, it's this is obviously a new topic. The COVID-19 vaccine is a relatively new topic for us to be discussing, but I've been talking about uh, vaccines for my whole career, uh, so this is, feels very natural to me. So we did want to start with just talking a little bit about the state of the COVID-19 pandemic right now. Um, and I'm going to need readers if I'm going <laughs> to see them in that room. There we go. So um, you'll you'll see on this slide that we are, there's two big orange peaks there on that bottom slide and on that bottom table. The first was the surge that we had in northern Michigan last fall, in October, November, December, and then we saw that decline and then raise again more recently. So we've had a real, really significant increase here in northern Michigan. Within months in healthcare, we had more inpatients this spring than we did last fall. Uh, so we've seen a really significant um, increase in COVID-19 disease activity, but you'll also notice that that is starting to come back down. So we're glad to see that uh, the numbers are starting to return more towards normal. For the state of Michigan, over the last 14 days, 9% or 9.2% of tests have come back positive. That number had been as well into the double digits. Here in Northern Michigan, that number had been close to 20% for a while. So we're starting to see a decrease. It's not where we want it to be. Um, below 5% is where we start to feel a little bit more comfortable. So not quite there, but we're heading in the right direction. Um, and if you go to the next slide, this slide really shows uh, for the months in healthcare region specifically. So we saw for the state of Michigan, it was about 9.2%, not about, it was 9.2% of tests that were coming back positive over the last two weeks. Here in Northern Michigan, it's 10.7%. So we're still seeing a little bit more COVID-19 here in Northern Michigan and the state as a whole. And I wanna draw your attention to that upper right-hand box, which shows the cumulative cases and deaths. This is just for the Munson Healthcare region. And so 767 patients have died um, within our Munson Healthcare region. That means the whole area that Munson Healthcare helps to service um, since the beginning of the pandemic. So, um, you know, I think sometimes we all get a little immune to seeing numbers, but um, to have 767 people in our region die is uh, really brings it home for me uh, as a doctor. Next slide. So this last slide on the current state is about um, where things are within our hospitals. And this is similar to that curve that you saw before, which had those two bumps, and that was the number of cases. The red line that you see here is the number of patients in our hospitals across months in healthcare with COVID-19. So you'll see we saw that increase back in the fall. It was going down very nicely. And then we had that really sharp jump up um, where that was our spring surge. And again, you'll see it's going down. We had a nice quick de decline, and then now we're sort of plateauing a little bit. Things are heading in the right direction, um, but even right now, we are seeing more COVID-19 than we would have expected to see um, if it had continued to decline as quickly as, it, as we hoped. Next slide. So Dr. Santangelo, the, the COVID-19 vaccine is now widely available in Northern Michigan. Can you explain why this is such an important milestone and where we are in the vaccination process? Yeah, it's really amazing that we have several vaccines that are incredibly effective against COVID-19 available to us right now. And that's just so, it's such a wonderful thing as a pediatrician where I've taken care of kids throughout my career who have terrible infectious diseases. And then throughout my career, I'm getting a little bit old. Uh, some of those diseases have had vaccines developed for them and we see a dramatic decrease in that disease. And the one that comes to mind for me is a bacteria called a strep pneumonia. There's a vaccine that has really decreased the amount of that that we see. It's still a concern for kids, um, but that vaccine has changed pediatrics during my career. And from the beginning of this pandemic, you know, we were hopeful that we would have a vaccine that we could use to get our way out of this. And now here we are on the other side with vaccines um, that we can use to get us out of this. And the most important thing for people to remember is that vaccines work individually. So if I get vaccinated, it does protect me. But because vac the way vaccines work, we need everyone to get vaccinated or as many people as possible to get vaccinated so that there's less chance of virus jumping from person to person. If, if more people are vaccinated, there are less avenues for the virus to spread. 
And, and that concept is called herd immunity, or some people call it community immunity. And that's when enough people in a region become immune to COVID-19, that even if there's an individual case, it doesn't have anywhere to go because every person who gets exposed is protected. And then that individual case doesn't spread and become an outbreak or more significant cases. And there's two ways to reach that community immunity. One way is for lots of people to be sick all at the same time, overwhelming our hospitals and leading to lots of deaths. And we don't want that. And the other way is vaccinations, where we have lots of people who will become immune and maintain that immunity for a long period of time and thus reaching herd immunity that way. And that's the reason that we're talking today. So I, I'm so glad to show this slide. This slide makes me very proud of Munson Healthcare. Um, we have partnered with our local health departments, uh, all four of the health departments that help to service the Munson Healthcare region um, with our op provider offices. We've held our own mass vaccination clinics and we started on December 18th at Munson Healthcare giving vaccines um, for COVID-19. We, in that short period of time since December 18th, have given over 78,000 doses of vaccine in our northern Michigan area. And that's a testament both to our incredible community partners who have helped us to get vaccine to them and into arms, and to our incredible community who has really embraced this as a way for us to um, see our way out of this pandemic. The, another really important point that I want to make here is that um, there's two ways that these vaccines can um, prevent mutations. One is that if there's less COVID-19 around, period, then there's less mutations. But another important way to think about this is the way that these, you know, we've heard a lot about the, the different variants of the virus that we're seeing. And viruses multiply inside of people. That's what they do. So if you get a cold, the cold virus goes inside your nose. It makes a whole bunch of copies of itself. And then that's how it can spread from person to person. Every time a virus makes a copy of itself, there's a chance that it could change a little bit or mutate. And some of those will lead to variants or different strains of the, of the disease. So for COVID-19, if there's a lot of people who are getting sick and the COVID-19 virus is making millions and millions and hundreds of millions of trillions of copies of itself, there's more chances for a variant to occur. If lots of people get vaccinated, there's less virus in people, which means there's less copies of virus being made which means that there aren't gonna be as many variants. So these, va these vaccines will protect us against the variants that exist, but they also will prevent more variants from occurring. So all the more reason that we really are encouraging people to get vaccinated um, soon so that we can put an end to this pandemic. Makes a lot of sense. So um, th I, th this is particularly interesting to me as both a um, pediatrician and as a parent of teenagers, um, the, uh, FDA and the American uh, Committee on Immunization Practices have approved the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for use in everyone 12 and up. And within the state of Michigan, because of where we are through the state's efforts to get everyone vaccinated and to have a good supply of vaccine, that means if you're 12 or over and you live in Michigan, you are eligible to be vaccinated. And so we that means that you can get a vaccine at a health department. Some retail pharmacies are offering vaccines. Lots of doctor's offices are offering vaccines as well. So um, please do, if you're over 12, uh, seek out somewhere to get that vaccine. There's lots of great resources. The state of Michigan has a great vaccine finder website. Um, so don't hesitate to uh, find a place near you. And the vaccine is available. All of our local health departments have access to the Pfizer vaccine. All of them are working hard to vaccinate anyone who wants to be vaccinated, including those from the ages of 12 to 15, 12 to 16. Um, it's really important to me that vaccines work. Um, and these, this vaccine went through a ton of testing as it was being developed. Um, and this vaccine works. And this graph is a little bit hard to read. So let me just explain it a little bit. The orange line that you see, um, that's how many people in that age group have been vaccinated. So on the bottom, you'll see 18 to 29, 30 to 39. Those are age groups of, pe of people. And that orange line is how many people have been vaccinated. The blue line is how many people in the, that age group have been hospitalized or are currently being hospitalized in this period. This was in March. So you'll see in March, those, those uh, older age groups that on the right-hand side of the graph that are 60 to 69, 70 to 79, 80 plus have a really high orange line. They have a really high vaccination rate. That's because at the beginning, we were only offering the vaccine to those uh, people because we didn't have enough for everyone. Those people who were more vaccinated 
have a very low rate of hospitalizations. So early on, we couldn't vaccinate younger people. And so their number of people who are vaccinated is lower and their hospitalizations are higher. So to me, this kind of graph is really compelling. If you're vaccinated, you have a much lower rate of being hospitalized or dying from COVID-19. So Dr. Santangelo, the, um, you know, we know that there are three vaccines that are currently available. And what's the exciting part about it is they are available now. I remember earlier in the pandemic when we were trying to figure out how to get supplies of, of vaccines and rationing them off to different age groups like you just mentioned. Um, can you explain uh, on this slide a little bit about um, the differences between them? Or is, is there one that's more effective than another? Yeah, it's a great question, Diane. And that all of the vaccines that we have are incredibly effective. So you'll see these numbers on the slide and you'll see these numbers in the media and other sources too, where the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are both created in the same way, those are up to 95% effective. The Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine is people will quote up to 72% effective. The hard part is those aren't head-to-head -head studies and they're not done in exactly the same way. So it's not that the Janssen vaccine is less good uh, than the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccines. It has to do with the way that you do the studies and whether you're measuring whether people get sick at all or whether people get sick enough to be in the hospital or to die from COVID-19. All three of these vaccines are incredibly effective at preventing people from getting sick enough to be in the hospital or die from COVID-19. So all three of them are fantastic. They're made in a little bit of a different way. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are made using something called messenger RNA, which is a way that it tells your body to make a protein that then you be can become immune to, and thus you are immune to COVID-19. The Janssen vaccine uses a virus that doesn't make people sick to help to get that same protein into your body and then develop that immunity. So they get your body to get to that immunity in a little bit of different ways, but they all three work very well. And the thing that's really striking to me as a doctor and as a pediatrician, the flu vaccine that we recommend every single year, when you do a study like you did for the Janssen vaccine, it is rarely 72% effective. But we know when the studies say the flu vaccine is 60% effective or 50% effective, it's still incredibly effective at keeping people out of the hospital. You don't get, you might get the flu, you don't get sick enough to be in the hospital or to die from influenza. So these, all three of these vaccines have better effectiveness than many of the vaccines that I really encourage parents to get that are routine childhood immunizations. That's really incredible. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, it's really striking to me as a pediatrician, when you have a vaccine that has 95%, that's, it sounds like science fiction to a pediatrician because it's so good. And it really has to do with this technology that has taken years to develop. This mRNA technology has been developed for decades. Um, and there have been barriers like cost to bringing it to market. And I mean, many people know that the Pfizer vaccine has to be in a special, super special deep freeze. And if you tried to make a regular, you know, a vaccine for something like influenza and said, everyone needs to buy new freezers, you have to do it in this, no one would have done that. Um, so the, the technology was there, it was just some logistical hurdles. COVID-19 helped us to overcome those logistical hurdles. And this amazing technology is now something that's that's real life. And, and if you can get any of these three vaccines, I, I tell my family, uh, I tell uh, everyone who asks me, the right vaccine to get is the one that you have access to. And it's always important to check with your primary care doctor. There are some specific like allergy situations or some very specific situations where there may be one vaccine that is more appropriate for you than another, but in general, any of these three vaccines, they're effective, they're safe, and the one you should get is the one that you can get. So great. Thanks, Dr. Santangelo. And I, you know, I think that's it, it's one of those things when we first heard about these vaccines uh, being developed that I think a lot of us thought, well, I'm I'm not going to get it unless it's guaranteed to be 100 uh, percent effective. So it was a really good explanation to even understand that even the flu vaccine or other vaccines aren't necessarily 100 percent, but it will keep us out of the hospitals, hopefully. So great. Thank you. Um, so moving on to um, switching gears a little bit, uh, Dr. Santangelo, uh, let's talk about COVID-19 uh, facts and myths and more specifically kids in COVID-19. Um, can you address uh, what we know about the likelihood of children getting COVID-19 and how serious uh, this can be? 
Yeah, it's a great point because we heard early on that, you know, kids don't get COVID-19 or mm -hmm. that they can't get really sick from it. And like so many things uh, that we about COVID-19 over the last year, we're just learning more every single day. You know, some of these diseases that I talked about as a pediatrician, you know, polio and measles and chicken pox. And these are things that I talked about every single day. And we'd known about them for 50 years. So it was easy to talk about all the ins and outs and everything we've learned. You know, we've known about COVID-19 for a year, a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So we're still learning new things every day. It, uh, children can get COVID-19. We are seeing kids across our region who have COVID-19 and who have symptoms from COVID-19. Probably the most worrisome to me as a pediatrician is that kids can get complications from COVID-19 and we don't fully understand what your risk factors for getting those complications are and what percentage of kids are going to have those complications. We just don't know. So if I had numbers that I could give people, X percent of kids will have the long haul COVID syndrome Well, they'll have fatigue like mono and they'll have you know confusion and problems with attention. If I knew a percentage, at least we could gauge where that is. We don't even know that yet because we just haven't, it hasn't been around long enough. Um, there's this very scary complication called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, which is a really scary illness that if kids get COVID-19, they can develop sort of an overactive immune response to COVID-19. They can get critically ill. It can lead to blood clotting problems. It can lead to strokes. Um, many children have died from MISC already. We don't know what the risk factors are for that or what we can do to prevent it yet. We're still learning. So children can and do get sick from COVID-19. They can and do have life-threatening complications from COVID-19. And then we need to add the fact that if children are having tons of COVID-19 and we're not protecting them, that they can be both a reservoir, meaning that's a place that COVID-19 can constantly spread from, but also those mutations that we talked about before, there's more of a chance for different mutations and different variants to occur. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm disappointed when I hear people say, it, it doesn't matter if kids get COVID-19. It matters in the public health standpoint, but as a pediatrician, it matters to those kids. Um, and that's why when the FDA gave their notification of when they lowered the age, I called my local health department immediately and said, can I bring them in in five minutes? You know, because um, I, I just really worry about these complications we just don't know very much about. And, and these complications are happening in our communities. We have Patients, children in our Northern Michigan area that have had MISC, been critically ill in intensive care units. Um, so it really is real. And that's heartbreaking to see that. You don't wanna ever see um, children be ill like that. So thanks for that information. Um, moving on to um, another uh, myth, let's talk about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine for children. Uh, so the Pfizer vaccine is now available, as we mentioned, um, for individuals 12 and older before it was only available for 16 and older. How can parents know it's safe for their children to accept? And as a pediatrician, um, what would you recommend uh, to your patients? Yeah, I think that this is a, a question that's been around since the really related to the COVID-19 vaccines for, for everyone and now specific to children. The question really is, you know, are these vaccines really safe? And, mm -hmm. and the thing that's important to me as a pediatrician is that the steps that you use to make a vaccine and then do testing first in the lab, then on humans as part of trials, and then roll it out. Those steps were the same for these vaccines, these COVID-19 vaccines, as they were for any other vaccine, the tetanus shot, you know, the whoop and cough vaccine, any of these other shots that we are all used to and have gotten since we were kids. The steps are the same. There's some very important safety rules that every vaccine maker has to go through. Um, and so those steps were followed. It's also very common for vaccines to get approved in adults because there's a lot more adults that you can run uh, trials on. You can ask for volunteers and uh, get a lot more adults to, to do trials of vaccines on and to release them for adults and then to go back and do further studies on kids. And that's what Pfizer has done so far. Moderna is also doing um, research right now on their vaccine in teenage patients. So Pfizer went back, did more studies on teenagers, children age 12 and up, and found their vaccine to be equally safe and effective in that group. And that effective part is important. There are some vaccines that work for adults that don't work for kids or the other way around. So it's important that we do all of those steps. And those were done in this case for Pfizer. And again, Moderna is doing the same thing. There are studies going on right now for the Pfizer vaccine for even younger children to see if it will be safe in even younger children. So 
these vaccines are safe. Um, and now we know from further studies that they're effective and safe in this same um, age group. So I think it's just great news for, for my family and all of those families out there who have kids from, from 12 to 16. You know, Dr. Santangelo, before we move on, um, one of the questions that we are getting um, through Facebook right now is, when do you expect children as young as six to be approved for the COVID-19 vaccine? So obviously there's some parents out there that really want some of their younger children uh, to be vaccinated, but we don't really have a timeline on that, or do we? Yeah, we don't have a timeline yet. And it really is because there's these very specific steps that have to be followed. You know, the, there are specific criteria around studies. The data has to be analyzed in a very careful way, then presented to the Food and Drug Administration, and then eventually to the Committee on, Committee on Immunization Practices. So there's a lot of steps to go through. And those steps are there because we want to be sure that a vaccine is safe and effective. So that process is going to take some time. We were hopeful back in January and February that we would hear about teenagers for Pfizer. So I don't think it's gonna happen in the next month. I think it's gonna be a little bit yet, um, but I know there's a lot of work going on because there are a lot of uh, parents who are hopeful that we'll be able to vaccinate their younger children and not have to worry about those complications we were just talking about. And, and we have another question coming in. I'll just ask, ask it now while we're um, on this topic about how they were developed and um, who they're appropriate for. Um, how long did it take to approve other vaccines? Like, I, you know, we hear that it's, it usually takes years um, to approve vaccines. And how many of these vaccines only you actually use part of the COVID-19 virus and how many use mRNA? Can you just clarify those points, please? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great point. So none of them use the COVID-19 virus. What they're all doing is getting a protein into your body that's a protein from, that looks like a protein in the COVID-19 virus. Okay your body sees that protein, develops immunity, and then when the COVID-19 virus shows up, um, then your body knows it, knows that that's the, the worry. Uh, this is not a, uh, this is an example that, that some people use. It's like if you showed someone a picture and said, if you see this, then I want you to do this. You know, if you, um, you know, every time, if you see uh, the stove is on, don't touch it. Um, and that's what your body is saying. If I see a protein that looks like this, I'm gonna prevent it from entering my body. So none of them use the COVID-19 virus. You can't get COVID-19 from the vaccines, any of these vaccines. Part of the reason that these vaccines normally take so long to develop is that there's all these steps that you have to take. So first you have to have an idea of what you wanna do. Then you have to start in the lab tinkering with chemicals to make something that looks like that. Then you have to look in a lab at, does it look enough like a virus? Then you have to test it on cells to say, well, do human immune cells, do they fight it off? Does that work? And then you have to test it. On. So there's all of these steps that have to be gone through. And normally what a, a drug company would do is do step one, get results, think, ponder, do step two, get results, think, ponder. And what they did here was to say, let's start doing some of these steps as quickly as we can, still doing all of the same steps that it would take, and in some steps, even overlapping. Okay, we're not sure if this chemical is going to um, work or not, but we're gonna start testing it on immune cells before we know that. And so these steps were kind of overlapping. There were hundreds of vaccines that were in development. Some of them never made it to market because they just didn't work. So by saying, let's just try lots of things quickly, we were able to get through a lot of those steps in a timely fashion. The other thing, just to be really frank, is that these drug companies, they didn't wanna take the risk of investing in vaccines that didn't work. So normally they would take one at a time. No, nope, uh, that doesn't look like it's gonna work. Let's stop, we can't lose money on that. Mm -hmm. With this, everybody knew it was a global good that needed to be addressed. So the, and so the vaccine companies were able to say, we're gonna try things even if we lose money at the beginning because we know it's important um, later on. So it sounds like it was an all hands on deck approach. Um, many, many people working towards a one common goal, which doesn't always happen and the funding was there to guarantee that no one was going to lose their business because of it. So that's, I think those are important points. I mean, it's amazing to see what the world can do when we, when we put our minds to it and our efforts to it. So um, Dr. Santangelo, you know, recently um, we uh, heard from some high school students, they joined us on, on a press conference. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to uh, take a minute. I'd love to share a clip there because I think it, it, 
is directly in relation to what we're just um, speaking about. And um, I wanna share this clip from um, a high school student uh, in the Grand Traverse area. Her name is uh, Leah Dozma and uh, she's a senior and will be attending uh, the University of Michigan in the fall. And um, I'd love for uh, you to hear in her own words um, what she thought about the vaccinations and why she chose to be vaccinated. So let's play that video. And a big reason why I was vaccinated, well, as an athlete, um, I just feel more comfortable now going to track meets and competing. Um, and it also gives me a lot of freedom, especially as a fully vaccinated individual. I do not have to be, va I do not have to be tested weekly starting next week. Um, and I um, am safe from being contact traced and, and quarantined. Um, because I'm fully vaccinated. So that just gives me a, it's honestly very convenient to not have to worry about whether I'm going to be missing out on a track and field event and any other opportunities with um, track and field. Um, and of course, as a graduating senior um, and looking on to next year, um, being vaccinated, I don't have to worry about whether or not I will be able to receive my high school diploma in person. I will be able to attend and I will be able to be there in person, which is huge and very important to me. Um, and then also at the University of Michigan, in order to live in the dorms and to also be an athlete on their track and field team, they require you to be vaccinated. So as a vaccinated individual, I, I'm going to be able to live in the dorms. I'm going to be able to have somewhat of a normal freshman year, which is also very important to me and many other people around me. Um, and I think most importantly, what really um, led me to be vaccinated and felt that it was very important um, not only for me, but for the people around me, is that I have seen the scientific progress that has went into um, the production and the, um, the how it's been given out, the vaccine. Um, and I feel like I am doing my part to protect the people around me, to protect my loved ones, to protect people I don't know that I see at the store, in the street. Um, and I also feel like now that I'm vaccinated, if I was somehow able somehow i got the the virus mm -hmm. um i wouldn't have it as extremely as if i was not vaccinated which also um protects hospitals from being overwhelmed as i know that the healthcare system has been extremely overwhelmed in the last year and a half and i would never want to be a part of i would never want to be a reason that that took place anymore um and to speak on the hesitation that i have heard as as well as Ethan touched on this, um, I think a lot of the hesitation I've heard is mostly the fear about how fast the vaccine has been produced mm -hmm. um, and also the fear of having a negative reaction to the second dose um, in particular. Um, and personally, I, whenever I hear these hesitations, I try to remind people of why the vaccine was produced so quickly um, with Operation Warp Speed and how um, it was given an emergency authorization and how the reason why that happened and how it was produced so quickly was because everyone was dedicated to making this happen because everyone is ready for COVID to be um, over. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I'm i really glad that I was able to get vaccinated um, when I was and as quickly as I was. Um, and I'm really excited to get back to somewhat of a normal routine. So that was a, a high school senior um, in the Grand Traverse region. And Dr. Santangelo, I think she said it very well. And I just want to point out that um, you know, she agreed to join that press conference at the last minute. Um, we didn't have, we didn't coach her on any of that. I mean, that was all information that she uh, researched herself and educated herself and really commend her on, uh, on, on looking into it because I think, you know, I was hesitant at first as well, but um, I, I got, chose to get vaccinated for the same reasons um, as Leah. So I, I don't think that could have been uh, uh, said more eloquently right there. So, um, so Dr. Santangelo, we have uh, one question coming in from our viewers asking, um, what are the steps they can take to keep younger children who aren't yet eligible for the vaccine protected and safe? Yeah, that's a great question. And we do know that those under 12 are still not eligible to get the vaccine. We, we don't have the data uh, back enough that we can recommend that. So for those uh, folks who can't get the vaccine yet, the me measures that we've all been taking through this whole pandemic to try to keep ourselves safe are the right things to do. So 
washing hands frequently, wearing a mask whenever possible, especially when you're gonna be around people who um, are not in your household and especially in indoors and poorly ventilated areas. Um, washing your hands is a great thing to teach your kids from the beginning anyways, and hopefully parents are teaching their kids to do that uh, anyways, but I think that's uh, really important here because kids do touch their faces a lot more. Um, and as far as coughing and sneezing, you know, I was teaching my kids to try to cough into their elbow uh, from the time they were very young, and I think trying to stop the spread of disease that way is important. That helps with influenza and colds and lots of other things too. Um, and then I think it's also really important to keep your kid healthy in general. So, you know, having you making sure your kids get lots of sleep, making sure that they uh, are getting their other normal childhood immunizations um, is really important. Um, and then continuing to social distance, uh, especially inside, but really when you're around people from other households, continuing to social distance when you can. Great, thanks Dr. Santangelo. Uh, let's talk more about COVID-19 uh, myths and facts. So um, I think we, we already pretty much touched on this one uh, that the vaccines were rushed to market uh, and they didn't follow the traditional process. We just talked about that a lot. Is there anything else you'd wanna add um, to you know, discuss or, or emphasize this fact? You know, the, that, the, that they are safe and they weren't rushed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think there's just two other things to say. One is that, you know, there are uh, COVID-19 is in a family of viruses called coronaviruses. And uh, there have been outbreaks of different coronaviruses in the past. So people may remember SARS or something called MERS. Um, and those were other diseases caused by coronaviruses. And so um, one of the things that we are, uh, we were able to do is to use some of the research that had been done on those viruses to um, sort of make sure that we could start, we weren't starting at square one, we were starting at square five from some of the research that had already been done on those other viruses. None of those, those other viruses don't have vaccines that have been created in exactly the same way, but some of the groundwork was able to be done. Um, the second thing is that these, this mRNA technology has been around for a long time. I remember very early in my practice, decades ago, we were talking about when are they gonna start using this for the flu vaccine because it's so much quicker to make. So let's just do that. And the, the cost was prohibitive. That's why they don't do it that way or haven't before. Um, but this technology has been around for a long time. And if we were talking about it when I was in medical school, it's pretty old. <laughs> I'm with you there. I'm about <laughs> probably the same age. Um, so another myth suggests uh, that the vaccine can actually give you the virus. Can you please explain why this is not possible? Yeah, it's really, we touched on this already, but there's no virus in the vaccines. The vaccines just use proteins. Uh, they don't contain the virus. And so um, the reason that I think some people think this, and some people think this about other vaccines too, some people get an immune response that shows itself with symptoms when they get a vaccine. So we hope everyone gets the shot, it gets an immune response because that's how you become immune. But sometimes people, after a vaccine, that immune response that you develop that shows that your body is developing the immunity to COVID-19 will give you a low-grade fever or will give you body aches or that sensation we all get when you just don't feel right when you know you're about to get sick. Some people get that those kinds of symptoms after they get the vaccines. That doesn't mean that you're getting COVID-19 or that you had a mild case. It's actually just your body's immune system gearing up to fight the virus. Um, so it's not, uh, it's not that you're getting sick from the vaccine. It's just that the uh, vaccine is telling your body, your immune system to get activated and sometimes giving you symptoms like that. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, Dr. Santangelo, can you explain why someone who's already had COVID-19 should still consider getting vaccinated? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, we know that these vaccines are very effective and there's some very specific data looking at how long they're effective. That data goes out about six months now, the vaccines are still going strong. It's not that they last six months, it's that after six months, they're still going strong and we're gonna keep checking. So we know that the vaccines give a really good immune response and they give it for a very prolonged time. If people get COVID-19, if you get sick with COVID-19, some people become immune and seem to be immune for long periods of time three months or maybe even more. Some people get COVID-19 and don't seem to have much immunity even just a month or two after getting it. So the hard part is we just don't know. If you had COVID-19, six months later, are you immune? We don't know. If you get the vaccine, we know you're still immune. So we really encourage people, even if they've had COVID-19, to get vaccinated so that we're sure that we're protecting them moving forward. 
And um, Dr. Santangelo, I guess it's, it's just so variable. We don't know how people are going to respond. Um, but what about would you throw in uh, these variants? Um, and you know, what are you hearing? Uh, you know, we're hearing that COVID-19 vaccines are not protective against um, variants. Um, you know, so why would why would people uh, get it? Uh, can you uh, dispel that myth or talk about that in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So we know that uh, the vaccines that we have are effective against the variants and protecting you from getting very ill. So it seems like they may be less effective against some variants, depending on which vaccine and which variant from making you sick. So you might still get COVID-19. But as far as keeping you out of the hospital or keeping you from dying from COVID-19, the vaccines seem like they're working really well. So uh, yet another reason. The other thing that we do know is that sometimes people who get one of the variants of COVID-19 in it, it gets sick from a variant that immunity from that variant may not protect them against another variant of COVID-19, whereas having the vaccine might protect you against both. So really vaccination is both safer because you're not sick from it, um, but also is a more reliable way to get that immunity. Great, thank you. Moving on to our next myth um, has to do with the vaccine altering someone's DNA. Is that even possible? No, um, your DNA is held in the nucleus of your cells. These virus, uh, these vaccines can't get into the nucleus, neither can COVID-19. Having COVID-19 doesn't alter your DNA either, uh, but these vaccines don't get into the nucleus of your cells. They don't get into your DNA or near your DNA and can't alter it. Our DNA is difficult to alter. Uh, we know there's, you know, many people might have heard of these gene therapies. You know, gene therapy is something we're hoping for for cancer and many hereditary diseases and sickle cell anemia, and it's really hard to do. Um, and these vaccines don't change your DNA. Right. If we could alter DNA, imagine all the diseases we could uh, we could eliminate across the world right now. So thank you. Um, so moving on, uh, many people are asking, can you tell us about the side effects of uh, the COVID-19 vaccines? And, yes. you know, are these side effects dangerous? Yeah, it's a great question. So many people heard about the Janssen um, vaccine and, and the number of people who had this really rare blood clotting disease uh, or blood clotting event after having the vaccine. And that's incredibly rare, way less than one in a million. Um, so there are there is this one very rare um, side effect from the Janssen vaccine. It's very uncommon. And we know that people who get COVID-19 frequently have clotting problems. So if you get COVID-19, you're at a higher risk for having a clotting problem than if you get the Janssen vaccine. Um, but that one risk is real and everyone should be aware of it. And it's a great thing to talk about with your primary care provider um, if you have a history of clotting disorders, for example, or if you were worried about that particular side effect. The other side effect that we see is that some people have allergic reactions. Um, and so, you know, you can be allergic to penicillin or bee stings, and you can be allergic to these vaccines as well. So some people get the vaccine and then have an allergic reaction where we have to do things like give them an EpiPen and make sure that they're okay. Um, those reactions, if they were, um, if you didn't know how to take care of them, they could be life-threatening. Everywhere that is giving COVID-19 vaccines is prepared to deal with those kinds of side effects. Um, and we can take care of you if you have that kind of side effect and, and it's not life-threatening if you have it in a, in a controlled setting like a vaccine, anywhere that's giving the vaccine, a health department, a provider's office, a mass vaccination clinic. So, so oh, I'm sorry, we have a question coming in um, related to this and in, in the allergies. Um, what specifically are people allergic to within the vaccination? Is it the protein itself or um, an additive or something like that? It's, it's a great question. Um, and the short answer is uh, it's not the same for every person. So it could be the protein um, from the from that sort of looks like something from the virus. That seems a little less likely. It seems more likely that it's one of the um, solu soluments, the things that dilute the, the vaccine that we give and that preserve it. Um, so it seems like that that's more likely the culprit, but it could be different for different people. Got it. And just one more question before uh, we move on. I, I heard that the risk of, uh, this is another question coming in from uh, Facebook. I heard the risk of getting blood clots with COVID-19 is just as high as um, with, with, the, with the vaccine. Is this true? 
Yeah, and it's actually, so if you get COVID-19, you are, it's more likely that you get a blood clot if you have COVID-19 than that to get a blood clot after having had the Janssen vaccine. Uh, you know, one of the things that COVID-19 does to us is it makes our immune system really go kind of crazy and it can cause all kinds of immune system issues like that multi, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that we talked about for kids. Um, but it also can cause your immune system to create so many chemicals that your blood starts to clot inside your blood vessels. And that can give you strokes or heart problems, kidney problems, lots of problems. So clotting is a problem with COVID-19 and it's more a problem from having it COVID-19 than from the Janssen vaccine. Right. So I, I think I cut you off. I'm, I apologize there. Is there anything else you wanted to say on, on that topic? Yeah, I guess the other thing I just want to say is that, you know, I got a, a sore arm uh, after I got my second dose of my vaccine. It's really common to have a little bit of body aches or some people are even having a low grade fever. It tends to be pretty short. Um, and I, I was up a little bit the night after I got my second dose. And uh, I told many people that I have had a lot of sleepless nights during this COVID-19 pandemic. That was the only one that I was grateful. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, I was really lucky too. I, I just had a sore arm after the first dose and nothing after the second dose. So it's, it's everyone is just so different, but um, all right, Dr. Santangelo, our last uh, myth here is uh, final myth of the day, I should say, is we're all tired of wearing these masks. Um, so once we're vaccinated, can we take them off? It's a great question. And the answer is, Sort of, or not really. <laughs> Sorry. So there are some things that not you the answer I want to hear, but no, I get it. I get it. <laughs> So there, there are lots of things that you can do if you're vaccinated. Um, and that includes things like being outside. If you're outside, um, you don't need to wear a mask if you're vaccinated, unless you're in really close quarters. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a lot of concerts going on right now. My dad's a concert promoter and everything's been canceled, I think, for this. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, so if we were at a concert and you were shoulder to shoulder with someone who wasn't in your household, you should be wearing a mask even if you're vaccinated, even if it's outside. But for most outside gatherings, you don't have to wear a mask. Um, our, our, our excellent guest uh, reminded us that if you've been vaccinated, you may not need to be um, quarantined if you have an exposure to COVID-19. Um, and you may uh, not need some sorts of routine testing, like some athlete testing can be suspended if you're vaccinated. You also can travel domestically without testing and, and you can visit other fully vaccinated people without wearing masks. If you're out and about, you know, I'm fully vaccinated. When I go to the grocery store, I wear a mask. Um, and that really is for two reasons. One is that these vaccines are very good. And they're, as we've talked about, excellent at protecting you against death and hospitalization. But some people will still get COVID-19 after being vaccinated. And 95%, if it's 95% effective, it means maybe one in 20 people will get COVID-19 after being vaccinated. I don't wanna be that person. So I'm still wearing a mask when I'm exposed to other people. The other thing, the other reason to wear masks is that we don't know who else is vaccinated. It's hard to say everybody stop wearing masks or you know wear a mask if you're vaccinated. Wear it. It just it gets a little tricky. Um, and so just as a general measure, until we have reached that herd immunity and we can say we're comfortable, this virus can't spread easily throughout our community. It's better to wear a mask. Now, Dr. Santangelo, you mentioned the 95% um, effective. One of the questions uh, we have coming in from Facebook is, what exactly does that mean? Does it is it dependent on a person's immune system? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. You know, everybody's immune system is a little bit different. When I was a kid, I, every time anything that caused sore throats went around, I got it. And I had two sisters and neither one of them would get sick. And I would get a sore throat, neither one would get sick. Uh, they, you know, they might have, get sick with colds that I wouldn't get. Everybody's immune system is just a little bit different. So for some people, the, the uh, vaccines will stimulate your immune system. You make a great immune response and you're protected for a long period of time. For a small number of people, maybe only one in 20, it might even be less than that, your immune system just doesn't de generate quite as much immune response. And so you aren't fully protected but even those people are developing some immune response, which is why most people who get COVID-19 after being vaccinated are having a more mild course than they would have if they weren't vaccinated. All right, thank you. So that was uh, the final myth versus fact section of our presentation today. So thanks for those great answers. I'm gonna turn now to the questions, uh, the rest of the questions that we're receiving uh, through our Q&A feature here and on Facebook. And I'm gonna start with um, this one related to, I, I think it's what we've termed long haulers of COVID-19. What have we learned so far about the long-term impact on the health of people that have had COVID-19? Well, we haven't, haven't learned 
uh, enough yet. So some people get COVID-19, even get very sick with it and then recover quickly um, and do very well. There are lots of long-term complications that we've identified of COVID-19, some of which are very specific, like some people will have strokes from having COVID-19 and the long-term effects from a stroke from COVID-19 are the same as long-term effects from other strokes. Some people will have heart problems after having had COVID-19. This is why you might know that for student athletes who have had COVID-19, there may be additional testing that's needed to be done on their hearts to be sure that they don't have any damage that would cause problems if they were in a competitive sport. Some people have this long haul COVID-19 where it takes a very long time for them to recover and they have fatigue and what's been termed brain fog, which I love that term because we all know immediately what it means when you say it. Um, and people have that for months and months afterwards. And we think that has to do with your immune system's response to having had COVID-19, um, but exactly why, exactly what the side or the, um, the risk factors for developing those uh, complications are, how long they're gonna last, what treatments might be more effective, even loss of taste and smell, which for some people can last months and months. We don't even know exactly what makes that happen to some people and not others and how we can treat that or prevent it most effectively. So still a lot to learn because this is still a relatively new illness, even though it feels like it's been here for a lifetime. It sure does, it sure does. Uh, the next question, uh, is, is it not true that even fully vaccinated, you can still get sick? How do you tell if you really have immunity and are we doing any specific testing around this? We heard about testing very early on. You don't really hear about it as much right now. How do you know if you're immune? Well, the, the short answer is if you've been vaccinated, consider yourself immune. 95% um, is fantastic. It's better than other vaccines. I get my tetanus shot every so often. I'm not worried about whether I'm immune to tetanus. I, I got my tetanus shot, I'm gonna consider myself immune. So if you're vaccinated, consider yourself immune. There are tests that can be done to determine how immune you are. And there are a couple of different kinds of tests. They're really complicated and they're really ones that are not done for other diseases or other vaccines on a routine basis. And they aren't done on people like us who've been vaccinated on a routine basis either. There's some sort of research tests where you can draw out blood and pull out white blood cells and look in very complicated ways in a, in a university level lab about how, you know, what, what is going on in there. Um, and those studies are being done. And those are the studies that are telling us things like, if you got Pfizer or Moderna, six months later, that immunity is going strong. Don't worry about it yet. Um, so the, the, that's what, those are the kind of fancy studies. For people who've gotten the vaccine, we're not likely to test everyone who got the vaccine and say, oh, now is your time to get a booster. We're not likely to do that just logistically. I would say if you're vaccinated, consider yourself immune. Great information. Uh, the next question is um, why do, so, First of all, um, can you speak to the uh, state's uh, my back to normal thresholds? And this question is specific to why do the back to normal thresholds not account for individuals who have already had COVID-19 as part of the 70% goal to reach herd immunity? Why would we only count the people who are actually vaccinated? Yeah, I, we weren't involved in the development of those um, those criteria. So, but what I would say is, if they had asked me, I wouldn't include those folks. And the reason is for what we talked about before that the immune response is really variable. So, do we count people who had COVID in the last three months? And then that number is always changing. Do we count people who ever had it, even though that immunity is going to be gone at some point? So, I think that it's really hard to know how where you draw the line there. And because the immunity from the, uh, from having COVID-19 is more variable, um, the, then uh, I think I, it's, it just makes it really complicated. So I, I understand why they chose to make that decision. Okay. Um, one of the question, another question coming in is uh, related to the multi-system inflammatory um, syndrome that you mentioned earlier. How widespread is that nationally? Um, and do we know how many children have actually had COVID-19 and have had no issues? It's a great question and we don't know. And that's partly why it makes me so nervous. So as far as the, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, it was recognized 
last summer, we it was initially classified. There's another disease that kind of looks like this that you can get from other viruses. So we kind of thought, well, maybe this is the same thing. Maybe it's something a little different. That the other illness is called Kawasaki syndrome. And we thought, well, maybe this is just Kawasaki syndrome, but it turns out it's different in some ways. So now it has its own name. Um, and that really was kind of last summer that that was all shaking out. As far as data collected, you know, this as a pediatrician, I can't tell you how many times I saw kids in my office a couple times before I, I really knew what was going on if they were really sick. And so the last data that I saw was a month ago, and there had been somewhere between 50 and 75 cases of MISC in Michigan. Um, and I don't have a number nationally right at the tip of my fingers, I apologize. Um, so it's not something that we're seeing you know, a million cases of. But the hardest part to me is how many kids have that and it's not fully diagnosed because it's brand new and we weren't even looking for it at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, how many kids have it in a milder form? But maybe there's still some prolonged um, prolonged uh, uh, complications from that. So still a lot to learn. Yeah, great answer. Um, next question is, and I think this is a really, really good question because there's a lot of different information out there and it's really, I think, difficult to sort through. So the question is, if we are to consider ourselves immune, if vaccinated, why can't we let our guard down? A great question. It is. I have to say, yeah. uh, it's whoever asked that, thank you for asking, because I do, every time I talk about this, it sort of seems like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. One, <laughs> right? I mean, saying you're vaccinated, you know, be proud of the fact that you're vaccinated, you're going to be healthy and wear a mask. So I think it is a little bit confusing. And, and really the, the reasons, so when I say I want you to consider yourself immune, I don't want people to worry. I got the vaccine. Do I need to test every so often to see if it's still working? Um, should I just, after six months, consider myself not vaccinated again. And that's the part that I mean, consider yourself immune. If you're vaccinated, you're vaccinated. I don't want you to worry about gradations, one vaccine versus another, or, you know, um, two weeks after the vaccine to two months after the vaccine. I don't want you to worry about that. Once you're vaccinated, you're two weeks after your final dose of your series, you're good. You're immune. You're immune. The reason that we still want people to wear masks is, is really twofold. It's number one, because the, the vaccines are not perfect. They're amazingly good, but they're not perfect. And so we really want, you know, we want to keep this disease down. We want to prevent the spread of more variants like we talked about at the beginning. Um, and secondly, it's because, you know, these, uh, like we said, these vaccines are amazingly good. But if they are going to protect me against, let's just say, the Brazil variant, if they're going to protect me against that variant making me sick enough to be in the hospital or die from COVID-19, but maybe aren't going to protect me against getting sick, I don't want to get sick from COVID-19. It's terrible. So I'm going to wear a mask when I'm at the grocery store, even though I'm vaccinated, because it's going to protect me more fully. So I, I agree. It's a really complicated message. And thank you to the question asker. Um, and that's hopefully that helps to answer that question. So Dr. Santangelo, I'm going to throw a curveball at you here. Okay. Uh, this is so... <laughs> Breaking news, um, someone just sent me a, a news report that says breaking news in a major shift, the CDC will announce fully vaccinated people can stop wearing masks indoors and outdoors. There you go. As we say, we're so I think it yeah. speaks to the evolution of what we learn and what we know, and we can only report on what we know at the time. Um, so I, 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 you know, it's interesting because even if, um, just personally, even if the mask mandate is, is you know, lessened or um, lifted, you know, I used to do a lot of international travel and I know that, you know, culturally it is much more acceptable in other countries. Um, and many people have always worn masks if they have the sniffles or if they're traveling and it's really out of respect for, for others and, um, and also to protect yourself. So, you know, and I think about, I really think that wearing a mask helped me not get the flu too. I don't know if that's true or not, but I would see myself wearing a mask for a while longer just because I, I didn't get the flu this year either. So I'm I don't know. I, I might just keep wearing mine, but well, it's a great point, and it is. Um, it definitely is true that we saw almost no flu season this year in Northern yeah. 
mean, we had a handful of cases. Normally our hospitals fill up with influenza and we just didn't see it because people were socially distancing and washing their hands more, wearing masks. And really, you know, when you're the CDC, I'm not the CDC, for, for, you know, which is good forever, you know. So, but- It figures just when we're having this event, right? <laughs> right, but the CDC really is trying to balance, just like the state of Michigan is trying to balance, you know, what do, what's the risk and the benefit? You know, right. there is still a benefit. You know, the CDC says you don't have to wear a mask. There is a benefit to wearing a mask. Maybe that benefit isn't enough to tell everyone you must wear a mask. So we're really just balancing that risk and benefit. Um, and that balance has changed in lots of things throughout the pandemic. And it, this far in, it doesn't shock me that it would change in the middle of me giving an answer about wearing masks. So. <laughs> yeah, and we'll look into that more too, um, you know, as this uh, as, as we learn more about that um, and we'll update our FAQ section on our website, which leads me to our next section. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, if listeners have questions, um, what what do we do uh, if we uh, still have un unanswered questions? Because unfortunately, we're out of time today. Yeah, I would say there's just a few things. So please reach out to your primary care provider. Um, your primary care provider knows you, or if you're talking about your child, they know your child the best. So please reach out to them, ask them these questions. Um, you know, they know you, they know your situation, they can help to give you specific answers. Um, we do have a Munson Healthcare Ask a Nurse line, uh, which is on your screen here, and it's available on our website. And uh, if you Google Munson Ask a Nurse, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, and that that is a group of nurses who are answering the phone just to answer any questions that you have. So if you have other questions, or if you just wanted to, uh, to reach out to them, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, so please don't hesitate to do that. Your local health department is also a great source, not only for the vaccine, but the people who work at your local health department are dedicated professionals. They have dedicated their lives to taking care of public health, um, and they're also a great resource for you. Thanks, Dr. Santangelo. And I, I agree, the health departments have done an incredible job throughout this pandemic, um, and they're, they've just been wonderful partners, just like uh, Ryan and uh, Northwest Michigan Education Services and many of our school districts. So um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Santangelo, I know how busy you are, so appreciate uh, you taking an hour of your time to help answer uh, some of those questions and talk about myths versus facts. That was very valuable information, and we we really appreciate you being with us today. Um, as a reminder, uh, just a final note, uh, there are other ways to stay connected with Munson Healthcare. You can sign up for our e-newsletter, follow us on social media, or as Dr. Santangelo mentioned, uh, visit MunsonHealthcare.org. As you can see today, we will need to update our FAQs once again. So uh, I want to thank you for joining us and uh, hope you continue to stay connected with us and have a wonderful day.